it is a common belief among those who profess to be Christians that during the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ here on earth, He established a church. And uh, when He ascended to heaven, the church He founded was administered and tended by His apostles. That is why none of you are wondering why they were born and raised in various churches, in various religions, when in fact, their parents and even their forefathers claimed to be devoted Christians. What is the history of the church founded by the Lord Jesus Christ in the first century? How did it begin? What did the early church encounter during the administration of the apostles? And what happened to it after the death of the apostles? Join us and we will uncover the truth. When our Lord Jesus Christ was still here on earth, preaching about the good news, He gave His assurance to His apostles that He would build a church. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The church that the Lord Jesus Christ built, which He called My Church, started as a little flock, as attested to by the Savior Himself. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The flock of the Lord Jesus Christ was introduced by the Apostles, Church of Christ. Take it therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to feed the church of Christ which he has purchased with his blood. When the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven and the church he founded was administered by his apostles, what did the first century Christians encounter? Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. But in spite of the intense persecution, the disciples continued to preach the gospel everywhere they went. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. For this reason, the number of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ increased greatly. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Apostle Paul described how great the growth of the first century Church of Christ was. This is what he said. Who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet one another with a holy kiss, the churches of Christ greet you. The church founded by the Lord Jesus Christ, which started as a little flock, reached the Gentile regions. The Gentiles were people who were not of the Jewish race or non-Israelites. And if you noticed, Apostle Paul described the Christian congregations in the Gentile regions, churches of the Gentiles. Not because the Gentiles who were called back then became members of other churches. No, absolutely not. In fact, Apostle Paul made it clear that they also belonged to the church founded by the Lord Jesus Christ, which is none other than the Church of Christ. 
What did our Lord Jesus Christ forewarn concerning the church he built in the first century? And Jesus answered them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. False prophets, whom the Lord Jesus Christ categorically identified, would arise and lead astray His disciples. And as further foretold by the Savior, many would be led astray. Not only the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostles did also forewarn what would happen to the early church. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come, except the apostasy comes first, unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come, and the man of lawlessness, sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom, of perdition. The apostles foretold that apostasy or great falling away would come to the first century church. And from where would false prophets or those who would be behind the apostasy in the early church come? The apostles also foretold this. The time will come when some men from your own group will tell lies to lead the believers away after them. From their own group, or from among the Christians themselves back then, would arise people who would lead the believers away from the true faith. These people would preach lies to the early Christians so as to lead them away after them. Among the lies that would be taught by false prophets so as to ruin the faith of the early Christians were doctrines of devils. This is what Apostle Paul attested to. Now the Spirit is speaking expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from means which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. One way by which we can determine the false prophets who would deceive and lead the early Christians away from the true faith is through the doctrines they have held. They taught doctrines of devils two of which were forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. So, any church, any religion whose preachers teach and practice such kind of doctrines is certainly the one that has turned away from the true faith and definitely the one that eventually turned into an apostate church. Which church, which religion practices such kind of doctrines? Stay tuned and we will uncover the truth. James Gibbons, the second American who became cardinal in the Catholic Church. He served as the Archbishop of Baltimore, Maryland from 1877 until his death in 1921. He ordained more than 2,400 to the priesthood in the Basilica Sanctuary in Baltimore. He also served as a spokesman for the Catholic Church in the United States. In his book, Faith of Our Fathers, James Gibbons clearly attests 
that among the disciplines in the Catholic Church is prohibiting priests to marry. This is what he says. The discipline of the Church has been exerted from the beginning in prohibiting priests to marry after their ordination. Another authority in the Catholic Church, John Anthony Hardin, a Jesuit priest, a doctor in sacred theology, also a professor of advanced studies in Catholic doctrines at St. John's University in New York. He also served as chairman of the board of Catholic Voice of America, Incorporated. In his book, he proves that prohibiting priests to marry, or the so-called celibacy, is not simply a discipline or regulation, but rather a doctrine in the Catholic Church imposed on all Catholic priests. This is what he says. Inevitably then, the Council declared itself committed to a practice based on the mystery of Christ and His mission, admitting that celibacy was at first recommended to priests and only later imposed on all who were to be promoted to sacred orders. It saw here an authentic development of doctrine become practice. Hence, it concluded that this legislation pertaining to those who are destined for the priesthood, this holy sign again approves and confirms. Aside from prohibiting priests to marry, the Catholic Church also commands our members to fast or to abstain from meat on certain days of the year. This is confirmed by a seminary professor in his book, Manual of Christian Doctrine. What does the Second Commandment of the Church order us to do? It orders us to fast and to abstain from flesh meat on certain days of the year. Catholic authorities themselves clearly admit and provide evidence as well that the Catholic Church practices these two doctrines forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. It is an indisputable truth that these two doctrines, as revealed by Apostle Paul himself, are doctrines not of the Lord God, nor of the Lord Jesus Christ, but rather of the devils. Aside from adhering to doctrines of devils, another way by which the church that apostatized from the true faith can be recognized is through her mode of worship which prohibition of the Lord God concerning worship that the Apostate Church has flagrantly disobeyed. Worship no God but me. Do not make for yourselves images of anything in heaven or on earth or in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to any idol or worship it because I am the Lord your God and I tolerate no rivals. I bring punishment on those who hate me and on their descendants down to the third and fourth generation. The images or idols that the apostatized church has exchanged for the Lord God are mentioned by Apostle Paul. This is what he says. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Some examples of idols or images of men with four-footed animals or birds or creeping things that are worshipped in the Catholic Church are images of so-called Saint Peter, accompanied by a rooster, Saint Isidore with a cow, Saint Martha with a crocodile, Saint Francis of Assisi with a dove, Saint Rook with a dog. 
Saint Mary, which is also pictured as the Immaculate Conception, adorned with a snake. These are only some of the so-called saints whose images are revered and worshipped in the Catholic Church. In the Catechism of Christian Doctrine, Catholic authorities themselves admit that not only do they pay deep respect, but also venerate or worship such images of their so-called saints. Ought we to worship holy images? We should have, particularly in our churches, images of our Lord, as also of the Blessed Virgin and the saints, and we should pay them due honor in veneration. The images worshipped in the Catholic Church are but adaptations of pagan forms and ceremonies as testified to in the book 20 Centuries of Christianity. Then also, the new setup brought many worship innovations as various adaptations of pagan forms and ceremonies gradually crept into the churches. Images of saints and martyrs began to appear. The adoration of the Virgin Mary became a substitute for the worship of Venus and Diana. The Lord's Supper became a sacrifice instead of a memorial, and a priesthood foreign to the New Testament Church began to evolve. This blatant violation of God's prohibition concerning the worship of graven images or idols, along with the doctrines of devils upheld and taught, two of which are forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from means. All these marks unmistakably confirm which church is the result of the apostasy of the first century church. Aside from teaching doctrines of devils, the Bible further reveals how false prophets who would lead the early church away from the true faith can be recognized. According to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, they are dressed in sheep's clothing. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The sheep whose clothing would be imitated by false prophet is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb, or the sheep of the Lord God. Thus, it is the Savior's clothing that would be imitated by false prophets who imitate the clothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. John Francis Knoll, Bishop of the Catholic Church at the Diocese of Fort Wayne, Indiana, from 1925 until his death in 1956. Also, the founder of the Our Sunday Visitor, the one regarded as the most popular Catholic newspaper of the 20th century. In his book entitled, Father Smith Instructs Jackson, he reveals the truth behind the clothing of the priests in the Catholic Church. This is what he says. Father Smith, you have told me that you are attending Mass every Sunday, and I can well understand that you become quite puzzled over many things. You see the priest clad in strange vestments. You hear bells. You see the people alternately kneel and stand and sit down. All this confuses the converts for some time and wonder whether we will ever be able to learn how to assist at the Mass intelligently, much less participate in it. Mr. Jackson, I have observed these things and have been awaiting your explanation. Father Smith, the explanations are not difficult to understand. Once you realize that the priest deals directly with Almighty God and represents Christ, that is why he is clothed as he is. 
He wears vestments which are known as the amis, ob, cincture, stole, and chasuble. The vestments he wears are the garments of sacrifice. John Francis Knoll, author of this book. Over 3 million copies of this book have been sold worldwide, giving it the prestige of being one of the best-selling books about one-on-one -on -one religious instruction for Catholics. In this book, John Francis Knoll uncovers the truth that Catholic priests wear vestments known as the Amis, Ab, Cincture, Stole, and Chasuble. They are clothed as they are because they aim to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Aside from imitating the clothing of our Lord Jesus Christ, what is another identifying mark by which we can recognize those who would lead the early Christians away from the true faith? Stay tuned to find out the truth. Aside from imitating the clothing of the Lord Jesus Christ, another way by which false prophets can be recognized is that they exalt themselves by opposing the Lord God's command so as to liken themselves to God. This truth is revealed by Apostle Paul. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the apostasy comes first, unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. And the man of lawlessness, sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom, of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. Which commandment of the Lord God would false prophets transgress with the intention of exalting themselves in the place or likeness of God? Our Lord Jesus Christ tells this. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. The kind of fatherhood that is forbidden to be called to anyone on earth is the fatherhood of the Lord God who is in heaven. In his letter to the Hebrews, Apostle Paul taught what kind of fatherhood that the Lord God possesses which would be imitated by false prophets. In the case of our human fathers, they punished us and we respected them. How much more then should we submit to our spiritual father and live? Who made themselves to be called spiritual fathers? Dr. Leslie Rumble, a Catholic priest and radio religious broadcaster, Four collections of his questions and answers about the Catholic faith sold 7 million copies, making him a much-quoted spokesman for the Catholic Church. In his book entitled Radio Replies, author Leslie Rumble reveals something. Catholics rightly therefore called the priest father, not to the exclusion of their father in heaven, but as manifestation on earth of the supreme fatherhood of God 
in the spiritual order. In this book, authored by Leslie Rumbo, he proves that the priests in the Catholic Church are called Father in the sense of being a spiritual father, a title that is strictly prohibited by the Lord God to be called to anyone on earth, for it is equivalent to opposing the Lord God and exalting oneself as God. And remember, that is another identifying mark of those who led the apostasy in the first century church. Now, on the part of those who have been deceived by false prophets, how can we recognize them? What mark or sign has been given to them? Just as there are clear identifying marks on those who led the apostasy in the first century church, those who have been led astray also have a distinct identifying mark. The book of Revelation has this to say. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. The Bible exposes that the sign on the forehead and the right hand is one mark by which those who have been led astray by false prophets can be recognized. Which church? Which church whose members have been given a sign on their forehead and right hand? The ordinary method of making the sign of the cross is that which every Catholic learns in early childhood, the putting of the right hand to the forehead. The sign of the cross is made by putting first the right hand to the forehead. In, as attested to in the book 1,000 Questions and Answers on Catholicism, the sign of the cross is an inseparable symbol of the Catholic faith. What is the significance of the cross? The sign of the cross is an inseparable symbol of the Catholic faith. The reason the sign of the cross is described as such is because in all actions of the so-called faithful in the Catholic Church, they form on their foreheads the sign of the cross. This is what James Givens has to say. It is also a very ancient and pious practice for the faithful to make on their persons the sign of the cross, saying at the same time, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Tertullian, who lived in the second century of the Christian era, says, In all our actions, when we come in or go out, when we dress, when we wash, at our meals, before retiring to sleep, we form on our foreheads the sign of the cross. These practices are not commanded by a formal law of Scripture, but tradition teaches them, custom confirms them, faith observes them. James Givens, author of this book, once again uncovers a very surprising truth. In his book, The Faith of Our Fathers, he testifies that Tertullian, one of the so-called church fathers recognized in the Catholic Church acknowledged the truth that the making of the sign of the cross is unbiblical for it is not commanded by the Holy Scriptures. Not only is the making of the sign of the cross not commanded by the Bible to be performed, worse than that, it is the sign of those who have been led astray by false prophets and the mark of those who will not be saved. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. 
and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Great misfortune awaits those who possess the sign on the forehead and the right hand, for it is the sign of those who will be punished in the lake of fire. For this reason, what is God's instruction? So that those who have been deceived may have the chance to be saved. And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her pleas. Certainly, we all want to be saved from the wrath of the Lord God on the nearing day of judgment. You also want your children, your whole family, to benefit from the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't you? So follow God's loving instruction. Come out of the church that has turned away from the true Christian faith. That church that upholds doctrines that go against God's teachings. That church that is certainly the result of the apostasy in the first century. That is the truth uncovered.